Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Five Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan. The podcast is brought to you by Goliath Technologies, who help IT pros be proactive and anticipate, troubleshoot, and prevent end user experience issues, regardless of where IT workloads or users are located. And also by Liquidware, creators of FlexApp, the most feature rich application learning product on the market. To learn more, Check out whatmatrix.com for a full feature breakdown of all application layering products on the market. Unfortunately, I'm still a little sick from the flu. I think my voice should be a little bit better this week than it was last week, but it's still not 100%, but I hope it's okay. And now for some news. ZDNet have reported that Microsoft have stated issues with Windows updates that occurred on January 29th was down to DNS problems or DNS issues. I reported on some other Microsoft service issues on last week's episode, namely the fact that Xbox Live, Azure, and some of the other services experienced disruptions, which they stated was caused by a hardware issue at level 3. This Windows update issue didn't even register with me as a story. Perhaps it just got lumped in with the other services having that hardware issue at the time. ZDNet explained that only some customers in the US and UK experienced problems. Some found by changing their DNS to Google's public DNS, it worked. The affected customers are said to have been on Comcast in the US and BT Broadband in the UK as their ISPs. Although the issue was addressed on the same day that it occurred, with the nature of DNS, it took several days until the problem had fully cleared up. Sticking with ZDNet and somewhat another story about Windows updates, ZDNet have reported on pricing for extended Windows 7 support and patching post end of life. In a previous episode, I talked about the Windows Virtual Desktop, which is coming this year. Well, you get extended Windows 7 updates as a Windows Virtual Desktop customer, but this pricing breakdown is for those who would not be Windows Virtual Desktop customers, which at least initially is going to be pretty much everyone. Interestingly, the extended support is more expensive for those using the Pro edition of Windows 7. Much as you might expect, the price rises year on year and is only going to be available for a maximum of three years after the initial end of life. And those prices are as follows. For year one, which is January 2020 to January 2021, Those with Windows Enterprise would be paying $25 per device, and that's as an add-on. So if you're going to Windows 10 Enterprise, in addition, you could pay $25 per device for that extended Windows 7 support and patching. So if you're Windows 7 Pro, and I believe if you're then going to Windows 10 Enterprise, you can pay that $25 per device licensing. If you're Windows 7 Pro and you're going to Windows 10 Pro, it's $50 per device for that first year. For the second year, it's $50 per device on Windows Enterprise. And for year three for Windows Enterprise, it's $100 per device. Whereas for Windows Pro, in year two, it's $100 per device. And for year three, it's $200 per device. So it's substantially more. It's double the price for those on Pro. This yearly price gives access to cumulative security updates over that 12 months. It looks like there's a condition that, you know, if you don't go for the extended security updates in say year one, and then you decide in 2022 or 2021 that you wanna acquire the security updates then, you're not gonna get year one pricing. You're going to be paying for year one, year two, and year three. You don't get out of paying for that first year. There's ubiquitous availability in all programs and channels, including VL and CSP, and there's no minimum purchase necessary. In more Microsoft news, the Microsoft Desktop App Assure program, which I covered in a previous episode, is now globally available. You may recall when I covered its launch announcement, the program was only available to certain regions. Well, that's no longer the case. If you didn't catch that episode of the podcast and don't know what AppAssure is, essentially Microsoft have made a promise of no app left behind, which means they are fully committed to ensuring your business critical apps work on Windows 10 and with Office 365 Pro Plus. 
Microsoft engineers are on standby to help find solutions for your applications, even when that requires changes to Microsoft's own products. It's a pretty remarkable program. It's something they haven't done before. Microsoft have said they have already assisted hundreds of customers through the initial offering. And for those customers who have reached out to them for assistance, only 0.1% of their applications have experienced compatibility issues. So it falls in line with what Microsoft had said even prior to Windows 10 hitting the market. They're trying to do their best to ensure that desktop applications that worked on Windows 7 will work on Windows 10. And they're also trying to shore themselves up with this new update cadence that applications that are running on, say, Windows 10 18.03 are going to continue to work on 18.09. And I think this App Assure program is a big part of ensuring apps work just across the board. This helps Microsoft too. It seems like, hey, wow, they're really going above and beyond to help out customers who have application problems. Well, yes, they are, but the end goal would be that they're ensuring they're fixing that app for not just you, but also for other customers who may happen to use that application. So it's a great thing for us enterprise customers. This week, VMware announced their intent to acquire Aetherpal. I hope I pronounced that correctly. VMware state that they are a modern approach to enabling remote support with which will add to the intelligence driven workspace one platform by being able to provide customers with the following capabilities. The ability to remotely connect to any device in seconds from the workspace one console using any web browser, view any device screen in real time as if it were in your hand or through a computer's controls and keyboard. Resolve problems faster with immediate visibility into key device information, including hardware information, OS information, memory, storage, diagnostics, network information, and more. You'll also be able to retrieve and distribute files to remote devices to retrieve logs and update configurations. You'll be able to maintain user privacy and control while enabling your remote support from your enterprise IT. To me, this makes a lot of sense with VMware Workspace ONE. They continue to put together a very compelling stack for modern mobile device management. It's interesting to see the way that VMware is approaching a modern workspace and just a modern digital worker needs and how Microsoft are and how Cisco and Citrix and just everyone who's involved in this mobility and end user computing space. It's a great time to work in this area. Kudos to Mozilla. According to Ars Technica, on March 16th, Mozilla will release Firefox version 66, which will, by default, prevent auto-playing videos from playing. Yay! Google Chrome introduced a feature to try and prevent auto-playing videos, but made some exceptions. Mozilla's approach is much more restrictive. It appears there will be no exceptions made in the default settings. Now, of course, this is just the default settings, so if you have a site you'd like to allow to autoplay videos for you, you'll be able to allow that on a site-by-site -site basis. And speaking of Google Chrome, Google Chrome 72 released this week, and it comes with deprecated support for TLS version 1.0 and 1.1. Firefox already de deprecated support for these older versions of TLS. TLS 1 is over 10 years old now, there is a pretty big push from many vendors to finally do away with it. VMware, for example, removed TLS 1 support in the latest version of the VMware Horizon client. Relatively recently, Microsoft stopped support for TLS with its Office 365 services. And while there is no official line from Microsoft on disabling TLS 1 and 1.1 in Internet Explorer 11 and the, their operating systems like Windows 10, they are shoring up and trying to remove support or deprecate support in multiple products. I mentioned the Office 365 services, well, Surface Hub, Skype Room Systems V2, Skype for Business Online, and some of their server products still use those older versions of TLS today, but they've stated by the first half of 2019, they no longer will. I feel like inevitably there will come a day when a Windows 10 release will pull TLS 1 and 1.1 support and probably just disable that feature too. So time is ticking for TLS. Leapingcomputer.com has reported a malware campaign distributing a new backdoor Trojan named SpeakUp is currently targeting servers running six different Linux distros and Mac OS. 
by exploiting a number of known security vulnerabilities while also managing to evade all anti-malware solutions in the process. According to researchers at Checkpoint, SpeakUp is a backdoor Trojan that's exploiting a server technology that runs 90 plus percent of the top 1 million domains in the United States. It also presented the ability to infect Mac devices with the undetected backdoor. It's currently gaining momentum and targeting servers 70,000 plus worldwide, first starting in East Asia and Latin America, including AWS hosted machines. And with this, the US could certainly be the next target. Unfortunately, this one is pretty nasty. And like I said, antivirus programs or anti-malware programs are not yet detecting it. So we're all pretty exposed right now. ICT-R published another great performance analysis article, this time comparing local user profile, roaming user profile, mandatory user profile, and tampering user profile performance on Windows 10. I wasn't aware that there were big changes to how Windows processes these profile types on Windows 10 until I saw some of the discussions on Twitter regarding this article. The results were surprising for me. The one I thought would have the worst performance actually had the best, but with an asterisk as noted by Ryan in his conclusion. Every time I read these ICT articles, I learn something new. It's quickly becoming a one-stop shop for architecting guidance through actual metrics. If you listen to the podcast regularly, I mention these articles almost every week. So if you haven't checked it out yet, definitely do. It's ICT-R.com. Homebrew version 2 has been released. Homebrew is a favorite of tech enthusiasts and home labbers. Version 2 is said to be a big release and brings Linux and Windows 10 support. This week, Windows File Manager appears on the Microsoft Store. If you're feeling nostalgic and you want to go back to those old ugly GUI days, you can get it for your PC, Windows 10 mobile device, Surface Hub, or even your HoloLens. I would love to see this thing on a HoloLens. I'm a little late reporting on this next one, but Backlays.com reported on some hard drive failure rates for 2018. The good news is that this report has been produced for over five years now, and the 2018 annualized failure rate of 1.25% was the lowest by far of any year they've recorded. For this year's study, 104,954 hard drives were analyzed. The results provided aren't all that straightforward as some of the drives were used for more days than others, and in some cases, for certain models, they tested against a higher number of drives than for other models. For example, in the results, you'll see the Toshiba MD04ABA500V 5TB drive was tested using 45 of the drives and was tested for a total of 16,335 days combined with zero failures. Now, if I just saw that number by itself, it would be very impressive. But then you see some of the other drives like the Seagate ST10000NM008610 terabyte drive, which they tested against over a thousand drives for more than a combined 442,000 days. And that had four failures. It's like, well, they certainly tested more of those drives for a longer duration. So, you know, four failures isn't that bad when you stack up the numbers. Really overall, as stated, the majority of the drives that were tested fared very well. A couple of the smaller capacity drives had higher failure rates, which is interesting to me. They must be investing in those larger volume drives that obviously they'd be selling for the most amount of money. Uber Agent version 5.2 has been released, which provides Firefox web app performance metrics, adding to its capabilities for Internet Explorer and Google Chrome, which were already available. Edge support is coming in future. Also, Citrix ADC monitoring for all of you ADC Netscaler customers out there. This week, Cisco completed an acquisition of Luxterra, worth over $660 million. Luxterra is a semiconductor company that uses silicon photonics to build integrated optics capabilities for web scale and enterprise data centers, service provider market segments, and other customers. The press release states that Cisco plans to incorporate Luxterra's technology across its intent-based networking portfolio, spanning enterprise data center and service provider markets. It looks like E2EVC, the awesome conference, looks set to hold an event in Lisbon, Portugal on November 8th through November 10th. 
And now this episode's hot job. John Hickles, head of cybersecurity at Source Technology, posted a job opportunity this week stating he is looking for an experienced red teamer for a remote role based in the United States. The candidate must have experience with full scope red teaming and be based in the U.S. And unfortunately, no visa sponsorship is on offer. If interested, check out the link to contact John, which will be found with this episode, which is episode 58 on 5bytespodcast.com under reference links or in the YouTube description. And now for this episode's weekly webinar. This week's featured webinar is by Microsoft MVPs, Paul Winstanley and Morris Daly. They hope to show you how to keep your devices safe in a increasingly rough and tumble IT landscape. By the end of it, you should be able to improve your protection with expert advice on security feature management with Configuration Manager, SCCM, and Intune, servicing and patching, Windows Defender Suite feature management, configuration baselines for security, encryption, biosecurity, third-party patching, and Windows Defender application control, and much more. With Windows 10 migrations being a hot topic this year, and Windows Defender in particular growing very much in popularity as an antivirus solution now, you know, Microsoft have always been kind of belittled in that space that they're late to the game and getting an antivirus onto the operating system. And now that they have, they get slighted quite a bit. But Windows Defender has come on in leaps and bounds. So if you're doing a Windows 10 migration, this is definitely one worth checking out for that alone to see how you can manage it with your existing configuration manager and into it. The webinar will be held with Adaptiva on Tuesday, February 12th at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern, or that's 5 p.m. GMT for those in Europe. And now for this episode, scripts, tricks, and tips. Damien Van Robes shared a pretty nifty free tool for checking BIOS settings on any Dell, HP, or Lenovo machine. You can run the tool to check BIOS settings on remote machines or just check your local machine that you're running the tool on. You can even compare BIOS settings between machines, which could be handy if you're, say, having issues on a certain model of laptop in the organization and want to compare one machine that's working and doesn't have an issue with another one that's having the problems. I love this kind of community content. These types of tools are real lifesavers. They just save so much time and they're free. I strongly encourage you guys to check that out. As always, everything I reference on this episode will be featured in the reference links on 5bytespodcast.com, which is with episode 58, and in the YouTube description. That's it for another week. As always, thank you guys so much for listening.